Good afternoon and welcome back, everyone. Please give a warm welcome to HDSA's Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement, Dr. Leora Fox. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying convention. We've got a, a packed day. Thank you for joining us for this uh, clinical trials showcase session. It's really great to see such a turnout. And uh, normally I'd be a little nervous speaking in front of so many people, but after last night's NYA talent show, I am ready to go. So I'm Leora Fox. I'm the Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at HDSA. And I have the honor of introducing to you four speakers from the industry side of HD research who are representing companies that are all doing incredible work to develop experimental therapies for people with Huntington's disease. So this session is going to highlight clinical trials of HD therapies that are currently recruiting in the United States. Um, I'm not seeing my slides, but that's all right. They're pretty limited. Um, I just want to remind you now that none of the info shared here is meant as medical advice. Um, I'll ask those who are here in person. I know you're all eating, but when you're not, please keep your masks on over your mouths and noses. Um, Dr. Eric Johnson shared earlier some of HDSA's resources for learning about and participating in clinical trials. So uh, I'll simply remind you of those and highlight hdtrialfinder.org. And uh, that specifically lists recruiting clinical trials, not only the ones that you will be hearing about today, but many other local and observational and smaller drug studies as well. I'd also like to mention that you can continue to participate in research at convention. We've been mentioning a lot this blood draw study, but there are also in your online exhibit hall and in the live exhibit hall, there are opportunities to participate in surveys. And we've been mentioning these at research sessions, uh, but if you go into the exhibit hall, you'll see lots of different little listings, and I uh, encourage you to explore those because those are survey, there are lots of surveys that you can easily participate in from anywhere you are. So on to our speakers, uh, and I will do intros uh, for each of them separately. We'll do a little bit of Q&A in between presentations, but right now I would just like to briefly let you know that today we have Dr. Harry Ramos, Senior Medical Director in Clinical Development in Neuroscience at Novartis, Dr. Ricardo Dolmetsch, President of Research and Development at Unicure, Dr. Amy Lee Bredlau, Senior Medical Director at PTC Therapeutics, and Dr. Emily Leffler, who's a Director in Medical Science at Sage Therapeutics. So our first speaker is Dr. Ricardo Dolmetsch, President of R&D at Unicure. It's a publicly traded biotech company developing gene therapies for life-threatening diseases of the liver and nervous system. He's leading the development of a broad gene therapy pipeline that includes etranides, I hope I said that correctly, the first gene therapy, therapy for hemophilia B, and AMT-130, the first gene therapy for Huntington's disease. So please welcome Dr. Ricardo Dolmetsch. Okay, thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to tell you a bit about the, uh, the clinical trials we're conducting for Huntington's disease. My, my name is Ricardo Dolmich. I'm the president of R&D at Unicure. Uh, let me just see where my slides are. So these are, these are my disclosures. I am, of course, employed by Unicure. And of course, we're presenting this information in response to a request. And AMT is an experimental therapy. It hasn't been approved, and we don't know if it works. Um, so our, our mission at Unicure is to deliver uh, one-time treatments that transform patient lives. And uh, we do that by developing gene therapies. Uh, we, we, are, we are pioneers in the development of gene therapies. Uh, in, in 2012, we developed the first gene therapy ever to be approved in uh, the US or in Europe, it was called Glibera for hyperlipoproteinemia type one. Uh, we have subsequently developed a second gene therapy for hemophilia B, which has now reached its uh, phase three readout and has been submitted to the regulatory authorities for approval. 
Uh, but today I'm gonna focus really on AMT-130, which is our gene therapy for Huntington's disease. We, we have a pipeline of gene therapies for other neurodegenerative diseases uh, coming behind our, our Huntington's therapy, but at the moment we're very focused on, on this trial and on this disease, and we're very committed to uh, this community. Uh, we are based in uh, Lexington, uh, Massachusetts, but we also have a research and development site in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, just to, to start, just to kind of set the, set the stage for what we do, uh, what is gene therapy? And uh, so at the very highest level, you can think of gene therapy as just a technique to correct, uh, uh, reduce or replace genes that cause disease using benign viruses. Uh, we think of gene therapy sort of in two pieces. There is the, the vector, which is normally derived from a non-pathogenic virus. So it's a virus that doesn't have, give you any symptoms. So in our case, we use something called adeno-associated virus, which is uh, something we all have. You all have adeno-associated viruses. They don't give you any symptoms. They don't replicate on their own. Uh, and uh, inside that kind of capsid or that vector, we have a cargo. And then we deliver this uh, to different tissues. So for example, for hemophilia, we've delivered it to the liver. And for Huntington's disease, we're delivering it into the brain, which is, of course, the part of your body that is affected by the disease. Um, so you all know about this, and I don't have to take you through what we know about Huntington's disease, uh, except to tell you how it is that AMT-130 works. So you know, of course, that uh, an expansion, a trinucleotide expansion in the Huntington gene uh, is what causes Huntington's. This in turn leads to a production of an mRNA that might itself be toxic, which in turn leads to the production of a protein that has this polyglutamine that can aggregate and causes toxicity in uh, deep parts of the brain initially in ways that we don't completely understand. Um, what AMT-130 does is it actually prevents the production of that toxic RNA. Uh, and in doing this, it should reduce the toxic uh, uh, protein, it should reduce protein aggregation, and ultimately, we hope it'll prevent neuronal toxicity and the progression of the disease. Um, so a little bit more about what our gene therapy actually is. So the, the vector, uh, the virus that I talked about, is something called AAV5. So AAV stands for adeno-associated virus, uh, and it is one of a family of non-pathogenic vectors that uh, we have been using in the clinic for more than 20 years. So we have a lot of experience both manufacturing it and delivering it and making it safely. Uh, inside it, we have uh, what is called a microRNA. And so a microRNA is a very short piece of RNA that can bind to the longer pathogenic uh, RNA that encodes the mutant Huntington protein and cause it to be degraded. And again, we have spent decades honing in this technology so we can use this to reduce or eliminate the expression of proteins that are toxic. Uh, the way we administer it is we introduce it directly into the deep parts of the brain. And the reason we do this is because we want to make absolutely sure that we're delivering it to all the cells that really require the treatment. So very specifically, we're injecting it into the striatum. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense for how this is done, this is a little, a little uh, video that, that we have made to just sort of try and explain how this works. So, so deep in your brain, there is the striatum, which is composed of two structures, the putamen and the caudate nucleus. And uh, during, the, during the administration, we're gonna be focused on actually delivering our AV to those two regions. And we do this by introducing a very, very thin uh, catheter. It's much thinner than a cocktail straw, so actually you, can, you can't feel the, the, the uh, incisions in your, in, your, in your head. And then we deposit these boluses, and then uh, over time, the virus spreads to the entire uh, striatum, and then it actually gradually spreads to the whole brain. And we, we know this because we've studied this in uh, preclinical species in mice, and then in pigs. We, we generated a large pig colony of pigs that have Huntington's disease, and we tested it in the pigs first. We've been doing this for more than a decade. Um, 
So, um, so this is how we're studying this in, in humans. Um, we have two ongoing clinical trials called HD gene TRX1 and HD gene TRX2. The main difference is, well, there are several differences. One, of course, is that HD TRX1 is in the US. Uh, in this trial, we are studying two doses of uh, our gene therapy, a low dose, and there are six patients that were enrolled in that low dose cohort, and then a high dose, and there were 10 patients that were in, enrolled in that uh, high dose cohort. And then we have 10 additional people that have experienced what we call sham surgery, and this is our control cohort. And this is a blinded study, so uh, we, I, I, don't, I don't know who got the therapy, and neither do the surgeons, and uh, neither do the people who are doing the evaluations or the patients. And then after a year, uh, the people who got the sham uh, or the control will then be eligible to get the actual therapy. And in the European Union, we're doing a similar study, but in that case, we are uh, enrolling six patients in the low dose and nine patients in the high dose. And there is no placebo control because uh, we, uh, well, we want to maximize the number of people who get our therapy, but also because in the uh, European Union, the authorities uh, allowed us to do that. Um, so how, how, is, how is the study designed? Um, so as I said, it's double-blinded, so that uh, what the results that we get are uh, more robust. Um, there are these two dose levels. Um, the numbers are not that meaningful. These are genome copies per patient. Uh, but just so you know, it's about a tenfold difference between the low dose and the high dose. And what that actually changes is not the degree of suppression, but the amount of brain that we cover. Um, it's a one-time surgery. The surgery takes, uh, well, the whole process takes about two days. Uh, the surgery takes one, takes one day, more or less. Um, and then we have this blinded follow-up for one year. And then at the end of one year, we unblind it, and then we would cross over patients that got the placebo. Uh, the total follow-up is for five years, and we will continue uh, actually assessing the, uh, the results of our trial for, for, uh, for five years. Uh, and then we're conducting this in approximately 15 centers in the U.S. and the EU. Um, so so what, what, are, what is the eligibility? Uh, so the subjects uh, 25 to 65 years of age of both sexes uh, with uh, early manifest Huntington's disease, so the very, very earliest stage uh, with a total functional capacity of 9 to 13, so still quite functional. You might ask why, and the main reason is that we don't believe we can bring back uh, neurons that are gone, but we do believe we can prevent neurons that are still there from continuing to degenerate, and so we would like to be able to uh, preserve function as long as we can. Uh, we are enrolling patients that have more than 40 CAG repeats, uh, and it's, this is key. It's important that uh, subjects have enough striatal volume so that we can do the surgery safely. Um, and then, of course, uh, they, you, uh, any, uh, anybody who wants to be in the trial needs to be on HD medication, but it has to be stable over the last three months. So some of the exclusion criteria, uh, we, you can't be getting a, another uh, gene therapy or another treatment. Uh, anything that would prevent you from actually getting a surgery and even though it is a relatively uh, benign surgery, it's still a surgery, and then any other evidence of any other major illnesses. So what, what are we going to uh, ask? What are the questions that we're asking in, this, in this, these clinical trials? So the first question, of course, always when you put something in humans is, is it safe? We, want to, we don't want to do any harm, and that's always the first question. You know, we've, of course, studied this in mice and in pigs and in non-human primates but this is the first time we put it in, in people. So it's very important for us that it's safe. Uh, we want to make sure that we can actually reduce the production of the mutant protein, and we're measuring that in the spinal cord, in the cerebrospinal fluid. We also want to make sure that it reduces the signs of injury. So there is a marker called neurofilament light chain that is a marker of brain injury, and we want to see whether we can reduce that. Um, we also want to see what it does to the volume of the brain. We know that the brain shrinks over the course of Huntington's, and we want to see whether we can prevent that. But of course, most importantly, we want to see whether we can prevent the clinical progression of the disease. And so we uh, are using a whole set of clinical measures uh, that are kind of collectively uh, under the CUHDRS sort of family of tools. Um, and, um, and hopefully, we will get a sense from this first study 
whether it's safe and whether it actually is effective. So where are we now? So we have uh, already enrolled the first two cohorts in the, in the US. So we have uh, enrolled the low, co low dose cohort and the high dose cohort. We will have the first unblinded results from the low dose cohort uh, sometime soon. And we will, of course, disclose those. We are all about transparency. Uh, and then uh, next year, by the mid of next year, we'll have a one-year results from, from, the low dose, uh, from the high dose cohort and two-year results from the low dose cohort. And um, so that's, that's, that's the first, that's a study in the US and the study in the EU. We uh, have enrolled the low dose cohort and are now enrolling the high dose group. Now in the US, uh, there are more um, takers than, than we had places in our initial studies. We are adding a third cohort. Um, and in this cohort, we will also be exploring whether we can improve the surgery. Uh, again, the surgery so far has been uh, well tolerated, and, and, uh, but we'd like to make it faster and more convenient, and so that's gonna take, that we will explore that in our third dose cohort. Um, okay, so, uh, so this, this, is, this, is, this is it for me. Uh, if you need more information, of course, please go to HD Trial Finder. Uh, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, or, or you can also go to clinicaltrials.gov, or you can write to us, and we will uh, put you in touch with one of the sites and uh, see whether you're eligible for our study. Um, a couple of things. These, these are our patient advocacy uh, team. I just want to, to, you to see their faces. They're out there, uh, and uh, hopefully they'll be part of this community for a long time, uh, Dan Leonard and Edgar Vega. And uh, finally, uh, you know, of course, I'm here. I'm, I'm really just the very, very thin uh, point in a large pyramid. Uh, whenever I say, you know, uh, us, I actually mean they. Um, so none of this would be possible without a decade of work by the preclinical um, group at Unicure, the work of our clinical team, as well as all of the external scientific advisors that are making this possible. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. so much. Thanks, Dr. Dolmich. I'm going to read off a couple of questions from our Q&A in the app. Um, we've got time for a couple, and then the Unicure team will also be at their booths so you can continue to interact with them as convention goes on. So someone's wondering how COVID has affected your clinical program. Yeah, so uh, COVID was certainly a challenge. Uh, uh, we, um, I mean, both because potential subjects uh, could have gotten COVID. And initially, I think that was an exclusion criteria, though I think we're now changing that given that many people are getting COVID. Um, it's also been challenging, I think, because, um, you know, it just every, all kinds of clinical care are challenging and some, some surgeries had to be postponed. I, I think though, despite that, we managed to enroll the study relatively efficiently. So. So it's tough, but I think so far we have a fantastic clinical operations team that has managed to uh, help us through it. Thanks. There are some questions about safety, so I'll pose this one. Uh, have there been any failures in the surgeries in the Unicure, pro in the Unicure program or any major adverse events so far? Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what we've disclosed publicly so far. So. Um, and, and let me just say, uh, we, of course, we have an independent DSNB, and their job would be to halt the study if there was anything, if the risk benefit wasn't appropriate, and they have met many, many times, and they meet before we start a new dose cohort. So based on that, I can tell you that we're, 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 we're continuing. They've been enthusiastic. Um, you know, what we know so far is that the surgery seems to be very well tolerated. We haven't had any failures. Um, so I, I should. I, I want to be cautious, but so far, I think the news looks reasonably good. Thanks, and I'll ask one more. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, brain volume and uh, you know how, how some delivery methods might be affecting um, patient health, for example. So someone's wondering whether the low and high dose patients receive the same volume of injection. Ah, that's a very specific question. Uh, and uh, the answer is yes, they both receive the same volume. 
All right, thanks very much. Let's give another round of applause for Dr. Dolmetsch. And in fact, I am going to grab my own notes. Excuse me. <laughs> All right, our next speaker that I'm welcoming to the stage is Dr. Harry Ramos. He is a geriatrician who has over two decades of experience in clinical research and development. He was an associate professor of neurology and geriatrics and palliative medicine at Mount Sinai in New York and has resumed working in clinical development at Novartis Pharmaceuticals as a senior medical director in neuroscience. He's overseeing the clinical trial Vibrant HD, which we'll hear about now. Thanks, Dr. Ramos. Thank you. for my slides, but in the meantime, I want to thank the um, HDS, HDSA for inviting us to, to present today. So my disclosures. So as many of you know, despite our increased understanding of the underlying disease, unmet need persists for HD. Current treatments are, localized, are focused only on managing symptoms. Results with current symptomatic treatments are imperfect, and they can often have side effects that worsen other symptoms. There are no disease-modifying treatments that delay the onset or slow the progression of Huntington disease. H um, hunting, uh, Huntington lowering therapy or HTT lowering therapy are among the most promising approaches in development. And it's well established that m mutant Huntington protein is the main cause of the disease onset and progression. And Huntington lowering in HD mouse models has shown delayed disease progression, extended survival, prevention of brain mass loss or atrophy, and improve symptoms. Many therapies in development are focused on lowering mutant Huntington. So Branaplam is different than the other HTT lowering therapies. It is given orally. Um, the ASO are used with repeated injections that go intrathecally into the spine. Um, gene therapy requires an injection that goes into the intracranial area um, requiring surgery. So we, think the so we think the advantages of oral Huntington lowering therapy are an ease of oral administration. It's less invasive than other methods. And it can be self-administered at home so someone doesn't have to go somewhere specifically for this. And there has flexibility to start and stop due to any particular side effects in contrast with longer acting um, uh, therapeutics such as ASOs. We believe there's more uniform HDT lowering throughout the brain and potentially monitoring of Huntington lowering would be less invasive as it could be done in the blood. So how does Branaplam work? Branaplam causes an extra exon to be included in the Huntington mRNA, so that messenger RNA we heard about yesterday, and resulting in reduced levels of Huntington protein. So what happens is without, without Branaplam, the Huntington protein has all the exons together. And when they connect all together, they lead to normal levels of Huntington protein. But what happens is when you add Branaplam, you get this, if my, you get this little um, thunder uh, lightning <laughs> that occurs, and it introduces an exon which we're, we have here name as 50A, which introduces a stop codone, which does not cause the manufacturing of this Huntington protein. Therefore, it leads to lower levels of Huntington protein. 
So we've studied Branoplam in animals as well and have seen the lowering of the Huntington levels. We see the lowering of normal and mutant Huntington mRNA and protein, and it's by promoting that inclusion that I showed you of the extra, ac of the extra exon. Also, orally dosed Branoplam distributes to key brain areas to lower the mutant Huntington level in the HD model. Also, Huntington lowering is dose dependent and fully reversible. That means that the higher dose you use, the more lowering you see, and if you stop the dose, if you stop Branoplam, it reverses. So Branoplam was first developed to be used in infants and children that have a condition called SMA type 1. And this condition, these children are born with a genetic defect where they are not producing a protein called SMN, and it stands for survival motor neuron. And without it, muscles do not work well. Branoplam is able, just like it inserts an exon, well, when it inserts an exon, it actually makes a full-length SMN, and this helps the patient in the sense of motor activity. So with Branoplam, we've, had, we've demonstrated good safety and tolerability in these children with SMA, and many of them have been receiving it for over six years. In fact, Branoplam has improved their motor function and milestone attainment um, compared to what you normally see in these children. Many times they will not be able to sit because they don't have the muscle strength, definitely not walk, and we have seen that in these patients with Branoplam. And interestingly, we've seen that Branoplam does lower Huntington mRNA and raises the Huntington mRNA extra exon, which we can measure in the blood of these children. So in order to prepare for our phase two, we had performed a phase one study. This is a study that's done in healthy volunteers. And Branoplam was given at one single dose at various doses. And the results support a weekly oral dosing that we are currently using. using. Uh, we, this particular study examined how long Branoplam stays in the study. It also demonstrated um, what we were expecting to see the inclusion of that extra exon when we drew blood of these patients. It also reduced the Huntington protein and the Huntington um, mRNA, the messenger RNA levels in the blood as well. So on to our Vibrant HD, which is a study we wanted to talk to you about. This is a randomized, double-blind, placebo control, and it's a dose-finding study. The goal of the study is to identify a safe and well-tolerated dose of Branoplam that will lower the mutant Huntington sufficiently in the CSF, 30 to 50 percent, to expect a clinical benefit. Now that selected dose will then be evaluated in a larger phase three study to show a slowing of disease progression. The primary objectives um, are two. One is to assess the dose response relationship with the mutant Huntington, so as you go up in the dose, what happens to mutant Huntington, and to evaluate the safety and tolerability of Branoplam. There are secondary objectives um, that we are monitoring and assessing for pharmacodynamics, which means how Branoplam acts in the body, and we would be monitoring the clinical effects, the imaging effects, with MRI and biomarkers in the blood and CSF. We're also gonna assess the pharmacokinetics, which means how Branoplam is distributed in the body and how it's measured and it's metabolites. 
So who's eligible? What participants are eligible for this study? You're probably asking yourselves. It's any patient that's clinically diagnosed, patients with TFCs greater than eight, CAG repeats of 40 or more, any male and female from the ages of 25 to 75. As I mentioned before, the doses and the dose regimen was informed by our prior phase one with the healthy volunteers and in our SMA studies with the children that I had mentioned. In this study, about 80% of patients would get Braniplam and 20% would get placebo. And this is given on a weekly oral, as a weekly oral solution. And it's actually a vanilla flavor. Um, and I'm told that it's not a bad tasting one either. Um, it's an adaptive staggered dose design and it allows for data-driven dose escalation and I'm gonna go into that in the next slide. So this is the study design for Braniplam. I know it looks a little bit busy, but there are two parts, and I'm, I'll highlight a little bit here. So there's an open label, which is this blue section, and then there is this staggered 16-week dose range finding, which is blinded. Now, there are three cohorts in this study. Each of the cohorts has 25 patients, making a total of 75 patients in the study itself. We're going to start with the first cohort, cohort one, where patients would receive 56 milligrams of, of Braniplam versus placebo. After the 10th patient has gone through eight weeks of treatment and assessments, we have what's called a gating assessment. And I'm gonna highlight you that too, which is a star right here. So you have those patients coming in, then you have this assessment. And this is being done by an independent data monitoring committee. They are external from Novartis, and they are experts in Huntington disease and clinical trials and they will be monitoring for any safety concerns to see if the next dose may be opened, which would be cohort two, which is the Braniplam 125 milligrams. And so then the next dose would go, to the, next, the next dose would be the 112, followed by another cohort gating after the patient, the 10th patient finishes their eighth week. At that particular gating assessment, the, the um, data monitoring committee would choose between three different doses, a higher dose of 154, a middle dose of 84 milligrams, or a lower dose of 28 milligrams based on what they are seeing. Then that would lead to the final third cohort. And when the final patient finishes their 16 week of the dose range finding, then we would have what's called an interim analysis. And that's this other little star, it's a four star, um, where all the information from the 16 weeks in the dose range finding will be evaluated by the data monitoring committee to determine which is the best dose based on the safety. Once that's been determined, then that open label portion of the study would open up with all patients receiving Braniplam at that dose, and then that would inform us of the next dose for the phase three. The assessments that we're gonna be doing in Vibrant HD are pretty much the typical ones that are done in Huntington, um, the unified Huntington rating scale, cognitive measures, apathy evaluation, hospital anxiety and depression scale, et cetera. And we will also be doing biomarkers 
um, and these will be from the lumbar puncture, requiring lumbar puncture for CSF. As we know, the mutant Huntington is very important because that's actually what we're looking for um, to reduce, and also NFL along with measuring Branaplam. There will be blood collections for other biomarkers that are similar, um, and brain MRI to measure caudate, whole brain, and ventricular volumes. So the current status right now is we are recruiting. We actually started in December and had our first patient early this year. And we are in many countries, as you can see, it doesn't come up, I think, as much here, but we are in Europe, several countries, and in North America. In the United States, we have two sites. One is in Columbia University in New York City, and another one is in University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia that are currently recruiting. We will have two other sites that should be coming up soon in Tampa, Florida, and in Denver, Colorado. So in summary, um, Branaplam is an oral experimental medicine that lowers normal and mutant Huntington and messenger RNA and protein. Chronic, bron chronic Branaplam lowers blood Huntington mRNA levels in SMA children. Branaplam has been studied in babies and young children with type 1 SMA, as I mentioned, many over six years, has been well tolerated and efficacious. A single dose of Branaplam lowered Huntington mRNA and protein in healthy adults and it supports the data that we are using now for weekly dosing. And then, as I mentioned, Vibrant HD is um, currently um, enrolling people with Huntington disease, and it's ongoing. Thank you. I want to also give a big thanks to all our patients who have been um, volunteers in our SMA study and our phase one studies, our site investigators, our steering committee. Um, we have one member here, Sarah Tavrizi, and our other program advisors. So we want to give them very special thanks to them as well. And thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Dr. Ramos. We have time for a couple of questions. I've seen some questions coming in about not about the uh, healthy Huntington protein. We've learned a lot about both healthy and expanded Huntington during this conference. And um, some folks are wondering whether, first, whether Branaplam lowers both healthy and harmful Huntington, and um, what the implications of, of lowering uh, normal Huntington might, might be. Well, it does lower both, and that's something that we are monitoring closely. So we are monitoring in the periphery particularly to see that we are not lowering Huntington too much. Um, so that is something that we are monitoring closely. The second question I want to ask uh, from a couple of folks in the Q&A is uh, how is Novartis thinking about uh, Branaplam in terms of expanding to, th so this trial in particular is focusing on a very particular population. Um, and there are folks with questions about people who might be in later stages, people who might be pre-symptomatic, so um, curious how Novartis is thinking about, about that. Yeah, that's a good, very good question. And I think the answer I can say is that first we want to get the information on this particular study, but we are opening our eyes in the sense of looking at other ways and other, um, you know, populations with Branaplan. But first is getting the phase two dosing, understanding what the dose is, understanding the safety and tolerability of it before moving forward into other areas. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Ramos again. Thank you. And I'll bring up our next speaker. Thanks so much. All right. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Emily Leffler. She's a director in medical science at Sage Therapeutics. She received a PharmD degree from the University of Colorado and completed residency training in neuropsychiatric pharmacy at the University of Texas, San Antonio. In her current role, she leads clinical trials for Sage 718 in Huntington's disease. So please welcome Dr. Emily Leffler. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy to be here with all of you um, on behalf of SAGE to fill you in a little bit and update you on our research efforts in Huntington's disease. These are my presentation disclosures. Uh, I just really want to call out that SAGE 718 is an investigational compound and has not been approved by any regulatory authority for any use. My agenda for today, I'll start by introducing you to Sage Therapeutics since we are somewhat new to the HD space. I'll review cognitive Im cognition and Huntington's cognitive impairment just briefly. And then I'll move into a, an overview of our perspective program, which is our clinical development program in Huntington's disease. And then I'll wrap up with information on where you can go if you'd like to learn more or potentially participate in one of our ongoing studies. So to start, who is Sage Therapeutics? So Sage is a small biopharmaceutical company. We're headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're rapidly growing and have about 500 employees now. We, Sage is different in that we are fully committed to brain health. We're considered a brain health company. It's like we, how we like to refer to ourselves. In the, we are fully committed to developing therapies for brain health disorders and also where there's areas of high unmet need. Our science and our research and development efforts are focused on two central nervous system neurotransmitters, or sorry, receptors, uh, GABA and NMDA. So these are two critical neurotransmitter systems that play a role in how the brain processes information. And I'll talk a little bit more about the mechanism of action on an upcoming slide. Looking over at the right on this slide, you will notice that our company is divided into three main franchises. We have a depression franchise, a neurology franchise, and a neuropsychiatry franchise. And SAGE 718 is being developed in the neuropsychiatry franchise. So before I jump into the clinical development program, I do want to talk briefly about cognition and cognitive impairment in HD, really just so that I can ensure that we're all working from somewhat of the same uh, baseline. So what is cognition? Cognition can be broadly defined as the sum of all of our mental abilities. So this is kind of an abstract definition, but it can be broken down into and simplified by speaking about it in six different domains, which are highlighted on this slide. Starting from the right, you have complex attention, learning and memory, language, perceptual and motor function, social cognition, and perhaps most importantly, executive function. Executive function is the set of skills that we use every day as we learn, work, and just maintain our daily lives. Now, it's executive function that is unfortunately impacted in Huntington's disease, and it's often impacted early in the course of the disease, as many as 15 years prior to the onset of motor symptoms. If we look more closely at executive function specifically, it is what really controls our ability to plan, to multitask, to prioritize tasks, to solve problems, and to ultimately make decisions. So as you might imagine, if any one of these is impacted, it can have quite a significant effect on not only the individual who's experiencing it, but also family members and those around that individual. And it could potentially impact a person's independence eventually. 
Now at SAGE, we know, if we look at a textbook, we know what it, executive function is or what cognition is. However, we needed to hear directly from patients or the HD community to really understand what changes in cognitive function are you experiencing and how is it really impacting your life. To find this information out, we partnered with HDSA and HDO to do thorough patient interviews, well, I should say community interviews because we included 35 participants, 25 individuals who were early in the course of their HD, and then also 10 care, and care partners. And here is what we found. One individual was having a hard time making, or making mistakes at work. They stated, I'll do my job wrong, and then I'll have to redo it. Somebody might think I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm doing. Another individual is having difficulty shifting priorities. They stated, I've got something planned and the boss will say, no, I need you to go do this. And it'll take me almost one to two hours to talk myself into doing that task. So it takes a long time to switch. Another person is having difficulty meeting deadlines. They state, I am not able to meet my deadlines as I need to. I struggle to sit, to type, and to formulate sentences. And yet another person is having a hard time staying on task without getting distracted. So they say, I have something that I need to do, and it's like, oh well, I wonder what's going on in the next classroom. So many of you might experience these things yourself. And as you can imagine, as these things begin to happen, they could potentially impact a, a person's ability to stay employed and to maintain independence. There are no current treatments FDA approved for cognitive function or dysfunction with Huntington's disease. And this is exactly where SAGE hopes to make a difference. So with that, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and begin to talk about our research and development efforts in this space. The Perspective Program is the name of our clinical trial program. It's the name, the overarching name given to the whole program that will evaluate SAGE 718 in Huntington's disease cognitive impairment. Briefly, um, this is, I'm going to talk about the mechanism of action and try to simplify this for everybody. So SAGE 718 is an oral therapy that targets the NMDA receptor. Now NMDA receptors are found throughout the central nervous system and they're involved in communication between the neurons and have been found to mediate learning and memory. In this picture, SAGE 718, whoops, sorry. Uh-oh, can I go back? Got it. In this picture, SAGE 718 is highlighted in the blue here. So it will come in and bind to the NNMDA receptor. And it's thought that by binding, it increases the responsiveness of that receptor. So to simplify this a little bit, it just helps the receptor function better and more, um, more easily uh, move the neurotransmitter as it's supposed to. Our clinical studies are designed to help determine if by restoring NMDA receptor activity, that can we improve cognitive function in HD. So the perspective program is made up of three clinical studies. The first is the dimension study. That's, this is our primary safety and efficacy study. The surveyor study is uh, what we consider our real world functioning study. And then each of these studies will roll into an open label safety study that will continue for at least a year. Uh, incorporating feedback from the HD community, as I've mentioned previously, was very important as we designed this program as well. Uh, we've saw insights from the HD advocacy community, from physicians, from uh, families and patient networks, so that we could ensure that we heard multiple perspectives. 
We also analyzed large data sets that many of you have contributed to, such as Enroll HD and Track HD. And we really, we did that so that we could understand the natural history of the disease. Uh, SAGE, through thorough patient interviews, also developed the high def scale, which is a new patient reported outcome scale that we are validating currently. It will be part of these studies, and then it will be made available to the broader HD community, so hopefully we can give back a little. And then most recently, we finalized a partnership with Picnic Health, who's had a table out here during the meeting. And this partnership will help create an HD patient registry that will be used to facilitate research going forward. Now moving on to the meat and probably the, the most exciting part of the presentation, I'll go into some details about the clinical studies. So the dimension study is a phase two study designed to evaluate the effect of SAGE 718 on cognitive function in participants with HD. It will assess cognitive performance, daily functioning, as well as quality of life. And being a phase two study, we will also be assessing the safety and tolerability of this molecule. This is considered a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. It will enroll 178 participants. And some of the key inclusion criteria are indicated on this slide. Uh, basically, patients need to be between the ages of 25 and 65, have a CAG expansion greater than or equal to 36, be in the pre-manifest or early manifest stages of the disease, and have no features of juvenile Huntington's disease. Being a randomized study, participants will be randomly assigned to either SAGE 718 or placebo, which will be administered daily via oral capsule. The duration of this study is four months and will involve nine total in-person clinic visits. So these clinics will involve the completion of several assessments, both cognitive assessments as well as functional. And you will need to do a blood draw, um, but that's essentially the, <laughs> the, what the, the things you need to do. Um, as far as open label extension, once you complete the four months of the study, you can opt into the open label extension. This is a map of our clinical trial sites. So this study will be performed at 50 sites in the US, Canada, UK, and Australia. Currently, we have uh, 10 sites activated, all in the US. The US is ahead of the other countries in that regard. Uh, on this slide, the sites that are pinned in orange are the active sites. And if you happen to live in a location that's not near one of these pins, please don't let that discourage you from participating because we uh, will offer travel support if you do, if you still would like to participate. Okay, the surveyor study, again, is our real world functioning study. And it is designed to assess the differences between HD and non-HD participants on cognitive and functional performance it will also assess the effect of SAGE 718 versus placebo on patients with HD. And then it will continue to build on the safety and tolerability evidence of the molecule. I think, so if you just heard me, this does involve a non-HD healthy control population. So this will involve 80 participants total, 40 individuals who are in the pre-manifest or early manifest stages of the disease, and 40 individuals who we consider healthy controls. The HD participants will be randomized to either SAGE 718 or placebo, administered daily. And the healthy controls will not be randomized to placebo or active control, but they will complete all the same assessments that the HD participants will complete. This is kind of an intense study in that it will last two months and involve a total of six clinic in-person visits. The same types of assessments will be performed. But one of the, one of the main uh, benefits of this study, even though it's short, it is very necessary to draw the comparison between the cognitive assessments that you would complete in clinic with actual measures of function. 
and those being driving and uh, shopping, for instance. So to get at this functional component, we have incorporated a driving simulator and a virtual reality component into this study. So it's kind of cool in that way um, and something some more people might be interested in participating in. And again, on complete, after completion of the two months of the studies, participants will be or can be, if they choose to be, rolled into an open label safety study where everyone will receive the medication for a minimum of one year. Here is the uh, study sites for the surveyor study. This will take place at 12 sites in the US and Canada. We have one open site right now in Southern California, and we are working to rapidly activate additional sites in this study. If you'd be interested in learning more information, you can go to our internal uh, clinical trial webpage at focusonhd.com. At that website, you can pre-screen to determine if you're eligible, and you can also stay up to date on actively recruiting study sites. HD Trial Finder is always a great source of information, as well as clinicaltrials.gov, or you can email us directly at the email you see on that screen. This is my last slide, and just one of our SAGE slogans that I wanted to share with you. And this just reminds us that if we can look at the brain and see things differently, we might be able to make a world of a difference to people living with HD. And that's all. Thanks very much, Dr. Leffler. We've got time for a few questions. We've got several questions about the CAG uh, count eligibility criteria. So folks are asking things like, why, uh, what's the rationale for including people 36 to 39? Um, and it's interesting that this is one of the few trials that is including that. Mm -hmm. So if you could talk a little more about that, that'd be great. Yeah, so initially that was made, that criteria was designed to make the trial inclusive. What I didn't have on the slide are there are a couple other criteria such as TFC. So we do have a TFC inclusion criteria of greater than six and less than 13. So between seven and 12. So there has to be some functional changes that the person is experiencing. And we also um, are looking to recruit individuals with a baseline cognitive complaints. So there, is, there will be a cognitive assessment that will be completed prior to enrollment, just to ensure that you do indeed have some cognitive effects. So kind of by the TFC and the cognitive screening criteria, we hope that, you know, anyone that, anyone that does have a uh, CAG repeat greater than 36 could participate. I hope that answers it a little bit. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and we know that uh, cognitive issues can persist throughout the duration of HD. And so I'll ask you a similar question that I asked one of the earlier speakers, which is how is SAGE thinking about expanding this to people who may be in later stages or potentially earlier? Would that be something of interest? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we're trying to look at a population where we might be able to see an effect. Um, early data in a very small population of HD participants, as well as in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's, has shown that the individuals can experience a rapid improvement in cognitive function. So while this is very early data and not double-blinded or placebo-controlled, um, we're hoping that it will improve cognitive function and will potentially be useful throughout the course of a disease. And so as far as research goes, we will continue to pursue this in other populations. Another related question, I think, is, is uh, some, some folks were asking why HD, since cognitive issues are very common to lots of diseases, not only diseases of aging, but uh, many, many disorders. Very good question. So I'm, I'm not talking about the science here. Maybe we can come back someday and talk about the science. But it's interesting that um, there's, there's cholesterol in the brain. And it's been shown that 24-hydroxy cholesterol is low 
in the brains of individuals with Huntington's disease. So some of these data were analyzed from the Track HD database. And so this molecule binds to the same receptor that 24-hydroxy cholesterol binds to. So it's kind of like bringing together some of that early work looking at cholesterol. And this is a medication that's considered a neurosteroid that functions like that to stimulate the receptor in a similar way. I hope that made sense to people. <laughs> but we can build on some of our early science that maybe at a future meeting. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask one more question, uh, which is what are the expected effects? What's the, what's the goal practically? The goal is improved cognition and ultimately improved function. So you know, um, through these studies, the FDA likes to see an improvement, and they want to see an improvement in function. Um, so TFC is something, and one of our outcome measures, but ultimately we would like to improve cognitive function. Ultimately, people would remain uh, their activities of daily living, their working status. We're hoping to maintain function for longer. Thanks very much, Dr. Leffler. Let's thank her once again. <laughs> Our final speaker today is Dr. Amy Bredlau, who began her work with HD in 2010 at the University of Rochester Neurology Experimental Therapeutics Fellowship Program. And in 2017, she left academia to focus her career in drug development and is excited to be working with the HD community once again with PTC Therapeutics. Please welcome Dr. Amy Lee Bredlau. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, to the HDSE group for inviting PTC and myself here to speak. I'm very excited to be back in person in clinic uh, in, in uh, conferences and speaking again. So today we're going to talk about PTC 518 and the Pivot HD study. Um, as a reminder, nothing presented here is intended as medical advice and shouldn't be taken as so. This is for informational purposes only. And I've been asked to remind you to wear your masks when you're not eating, um, drinking, or on a podium speaking. So first, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about PTC. Um, at PTC, we are passionate about our purpose. Our mission is to bring best-in-class treatments to patients affected by rare disorders. We think that we are more than a biotech company. We're a cause. We're scientists and in innovators who find new ways to treat rare diseases. But it's more than about finding treatments. We're committed to making a difference for the global rare disease com community. Uh, PTC 518 is a new Huntington lowering drug in clinical trials for Huntington's disease. It's orally available as a pill. It crosses the blood brain barrier in hopes of providing treatment of HD everywhere in the brain and elsewhere, as well as HTT lowering in the whole brain. PTC 518 is a splicing modifier which lowers Huntington in the blood and brain of HD mice. To the left, you have a little picture of how um, splicing modifiers work, and you've heard a lot of that in the past couple of days, and I just, I can't top the Star Wars analogy from yesterday. So <laughs> we, will, we will just say um, the movie stopped. Um, and <laughs> And uh, so we'll talk about on the right, the lowering of Huntington that we've identified in the blood and brain of HD mice. Huntington protein levels in the blood, you see were decreased by greater than 50%, where the orange bar versus vehicle, and in the brain uh, by about 50%. And this is a really important proof of principle for us because we want to be sure that the design of PTC518 is actually effective in lowering protein in the brain specifically. So PTC 518 was uh, then investigated in healthy volunteers. This is a phase one trial. We started with single doses just to make sure that the drug was safe and kind of get a ranging um, idea. 
Then we went into multiple day dosing um, in healthy volunteers, and this is once a day dosing for up to 21 days, just to get a sense of exactly what 518 does in the body over time. We then tested for food effect. So if a person were to eat, for example, a high fat meal, how would that impact the absorption of the 518 pill? And finally, a couple of volunteers had CSF sampling so that we could check to confirm if PTC518 is in fact um, into the brain and then into the CSF from there. So firstly, we found that PTC518 was well tolerated in healthy volunteers. The most common adverse events were headache and, and nausea. No related adverse events were serious. Most of them were mild. No volunteers had to stop taking 518 for their adverse events, and all of the adverse events resolved without issue. So we concluded that this uh, PTC518 was well tolerated in these healthy volunteers. The rest of our phase one objectives that were met where we confirmed the presence of PTC518 in the body and the central nervous system in the CSF. We also showed mRNA and protein lowering with PTC518. And we were able to determine our doses for phase two investigation. So our phase two study, Pivot HD, which is really what we're happy to talk with you about right now, this is a study that will look at how safe and effective PTC518 in patients with HD is and um, lowering the mRNA and protein in people with HD, as well as assessing our um, pharmacodynamics, the effect in the blood, the brain fluid, and the MRIs. So this is a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Right now it's 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams or placebo. These two arms will move forward until we have a sufficient patience for a safety board. This is another independent data safety monitoring board, as others have mentioned today. They will decide if it's appropriate for us to open a third dosing cohort. Right now, the study is a 12-week study, but we're in the process of extending it for an additional nine months, so it will be a 12-month study. We'll enroll up to 162 patients in 19 locations. The study is open and enrolling, and we're happy to say we are dosing patients. After the study completes, there will be a long-term trial to follow, and in that study there will be no placebo, so anybody who joins that rollover will know that they are receiving PTC518. So PTC is recruiting patients with no functional decline. Now we're going to go back to many conversations that we've had over this weekend, starting with Ed and Jeff, and then again with Sarah today, talking about how we're going earlier and earlier in Huntington's disease so that we can really detect disease modification. So our key inclusion criteria, you must be at least 25 years of age to enroll. You have to have genetically confirmed HD, and we are looking just in the range of 42 to 50 CAG repeats. Your total functional capacity must be 13, and your independent scale must be 100. And again, this is to ensure that there's no functional decline, just so that we have a specific patient population to measure. And then we've talked a little bit about PIN scores today. So we are also enriching our population with the PIN score, which you're not expected to know your PIN score. But if you are interested in participating in Pivot, you can reach out to an investigator near you and they can help you to figure out what your PIN score would be. This allows us to select for a population of patients who are at risk for progressing soon. This will allow us, we hope, to determine the efficacy of PTC518 more quickly, which will allow us to go into confirmatory studies and hopefully uh, conversations with regulatory agencies sooner to expedite getting this into the market for patients. So the study, we have primary endpoints. Obviously, safety and tolerability are very, very important. And then also lowering of the Huntington protein in the blood. Our biomarker endpoints are lowering of HTT protein in the brain fluid, the CSF, blood markers for safety, and brain imaging. And then our clinical endpoints, there's a long list of them actually. 
So we'd really like to have a good sense of all of the ways that PTC 518 is impacting people's disease. PTC, um, sorry, PIVOT is a global study with 19 planned trial sites. You see they're all over the world. These are listed on clinicaltrials.gov as well as Trial Finder. So in summary, we're very excited to share with you that Pivot HD is up and running, enrolling patients and, and treating patients at this time. This is a new splicing modifier drug that is orally available as a pill. It crosses the blood-brain barrier and lowers Huntington in the brain and body in mice and healthy volunteers. We hope to confirm, confirm that with this study in patients as well. And you can learn more on clinicaltrials.gov, here's our identifier, and also on Trial Finder. And that's everything I have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Bedwell. <laughs> Got some questions coming in on the Q&A. And the first one I'll ask is, uh, what was the basis for the choice of uh, inclusion criteria in terms of CAG repeat? Yeah, that's a good question. And obviously, there are more inclusion exclusion criteria that you can look up on clinical trial, I'm uh, sorry, clintrials.gov. But what we're looking for specifically is a patient population that will allow us to get a really good sense of whether 518 is disease modifying in patients that are just about to progress. Thanks. Uh, another question that I see here is um, whether studies in general, and PTCs in particular, are being more cautious around dosing in response to potentially the uh, results of prior studies. Yeah, absolutely. So we all know that there have been some surprises, and that's never the intention with clinical trials. As Leora said in my um, introduction, I've been doing clinical trials for more than a decade, most of which actually are in HD. It's never our intention to lead to any kind of um, harm to patients ever. So we always want to be careful. Um, we think that the dosing that we're doing in this study is reasonable and safe based on our phase one studies. I would say that probably everybody is a little bit more cautious now though. Probably you are. Certainly, we're very attentive to making sure that we're monitoring for any kind of toxicity, and you've heard a lot about biomarkers and safety in NFL this past couple of days. And then regulatory agencies are probably being a little bit more careful as well. I'd say everybody has just a, a spotlight on that these days, and appropriately so. Thanks. I'll share this one. Someone's wondering whether it will be a vanilla-flavored syrup. But I'll add to that. Um, it is a yellow or white pill, and they're very small. All right. Good <laughs> to know. Um, and since you shared some data around Huntington lowering in animals, there's a question here about what the goal is for reducing both mutant and wild type Huntington in people. Absolutely. So similar to other um, presentations you've heard today, we, our agent does lower both mutant and wild type Huntington's, um, probably together, probably hand in hand, the same amount of lowering. We'll find that out with Pivot HD. And nobody knows exactly what the right answer is, right? Do you want 50%, 10%, 25%, 30%? These are questions that remain to be answered, but certainly those are questions that we will be investigating on this study to educate ourselves and the community. The next question relates to Enroll, which we've been talking a lot mm -hmm. about, and someone's wondering how that database is connected to recruitment, and does PTC consider Enroll when recruiting for a study like this? Certainly. So Enroll is not part of our inclusion or exclusion criteria. There are no rules for inclusion in this study based on Enroll, but the Enroll data has informed the PIN criteria that we're using. So all of that time and effort on the part of so many volunteers is really, really helpful to progress our science so that hopefully our studies are more efficient and more powerful. This is a question about the open label extension study, um, and it is 
Is, is the nine-month extension open label or is it placebo controlled? Right, so the nine month extension that I mentioned is actually an amendment to the current protocol. So the protocol will instead of three months, 12 weeks, be 12 months and that will continue be, to be placebo controlled. The study that follows will not include placebo. Well, I think that we have addressed most of the questions here and I will conclude this session wrap things up by sharing a comment from somebody, which is simply thank you to all of these companies for trying to help our HD community. And so I'll just echo that and we'll, um, we'll, we'll thank all of our speakers once again. Let's give them all a round of applause. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and interest. And I just, um, and I'm going to wrap up this session, give you a little bit of time before the next sessions begin at 1.45. Um, but I just wanted to, re to uh, remind you that you can continue to ask questions. You've had so many great questions and a lot of them we weren't able to get to today, but representatives from all the companies that, um, that spoke today are going to continue to be here for most for, for today. Um, Unicure, PTC, and Sage have folks at booths in the uh, exhibit hall. Um, and Dr. Ramos also let me know that he and other members of the Novartis team are available to chat if you want to seek him out outside. And if you're uh, listening from anywhere else, um, you can also interact with these folks in their exhibit halls and, and check more out online. So thank you everybody for participating. Go to hdtrialfinder.org if you want to learn more and have a great rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the convention. Thanks.